Hello, this is the RPG Crawler, and welcome to another RPG Crawler's first look. This time we're going to take a look at Evagris the Riven Realms. It's currently in development from Lost Pilgrims, and uh, is available on Game Jolt and Itch.io, as well as IndieDB. Uh, and it's currently available as a prologue, which will have an early access version available on Steam in 2019. The... Uh, Developers uh, just contacted me with this about about a week or two ago, so I only just now had time to look at it. Uh, it looks pretty good, so let's take a look. Okay. <clears throat> Supposed to have a lot of reading behind it and such. Uh, you play an armed traveling company, which is... I guess that's exactly what it is. Let's see what happens. The River Realms, they call it. What a fine poetic name for something as rotten and twisted as our land has become. Nice, nice. It was not always so. Long ago, the old empire, the noblest and most enduring society created by humankind, spanned almost the entire continent of Zerin, the cradle of man. I almost don't want to talk what over this just because it is well done. Progress and it's relatively well done for a, a for indie game. The Empire began to fall into stagnation and decadence, desperately holding on to their I'm not sure how many fantasy elements or anything like that are in here. The collapse of the realm, the Emperor and his theocracy took to measures that were worthy of true despots in cruelty. Subjugating weaker realms, enslaving whole nations. It's got like a classical period. Foreign resources. A Roman based empire citizens. War on several fronts. Genocide. Eventually the gods could no longer tolerate such horrors wrought in their name. Foretold by an abundance of divine omens, they descended upon the Empire to right its wrong. Damn. So yeah, there are fantasy elements. Thus in a chain of dreadful events. You know you fucked up when the gods come down. All right. The gods then finally saw what they had done in their anger and confusion. Really they now. They said that so much grief and shame filled them that they were broken and they left this reality never to return. That's unfortunate. What did they think that was going to happen? Dead. But at length, survivors began to crawl out of their hiding holes and face the land. Excuse me while I grab a soda. The fallout of the calamity now riddled the continent, and people realized that they had to share their new home with changed and twisted. Oh, weird. So it's like a post apocalyptic classical era type thing. I've seen a few games that use that kind of that kind of premise. I'm not now godless and vengeful reincarnated from the ashes. I don't mind long long exposition sequences but this seems important so I don't want to skip it. But I don't know about putting this video up with the whole thing. It might I hope they don't claim it cuz this is this is worth this is worth watching. So yeah, classical period, post-apocalyptic fantasy. That's it's not not bad. That vaguely reminds me of the Dark Sun setting. So, Vagras. That's where they get the name from. It's got a lot of known issues because, as I said, this is in relatively early development. They are still working on this. But I want to see if the core of the game holds. That's that's the important part. Because if you don't get the core gameplay of a game, then uh, then all else is lost. Bugs bugs can be fixed. UI can be fixed. But uh, but the core gameplay is what I look for in these early access videos. So I'll go ahead and do a new game. Don't even know how to play it, but we'll see. Hmm. 
It's supposed to be a lot of reading ah, here. Yes. A Vagrus. What a profession. Daring and savvy. Always watching the horizon. Always looking for an opportunity. And of course, for what is best for his comitatus, eh? And you are a Vagrus too, are you not? Many of your kind have I seen in my long life as a vagabond. Care to listen to a story about your exquisite occupation? I guess I'm going to have to listen to the same it story. It is a tale of woe and terror, but it is also a tale that is true, as I have seen it with my own eyes. Let's see what he has to say. So, you play the prologue because that's all that's out right now. So, tell us our, your tale, old man. Wise you are, good master. My tale is of a Vagras, such as yourself, but one whose fate was cursed and wrought with ill fortune. It all happened a long time ago. Ten years. It's not very long. Oh, I, I guess it is long for some people. Travelling rough roads and forgotten ways with this comitatus, south along the feet of the great mountains of the west. And so we start. I like these semi-animated uh, styles of uh, of uh, graphical things. They're a little bit better than just simple, uh, simple static images. So, no more voice acting for now. This comitatus I speak of had fallen under hard times. Perhaps it was due to imperial harassment or unfortunate decisions, or simply bad luck. Irafon, saint of Rhodes, does not always smile on us mere mortals. But however it came to pass, their coin was drying up and their opportunities seemed few and far between. One of the last chances their Vagras saw was to travel to the remote town of Scrap Heap and spend their remaining funds to stock up on cheap scrap metal. This metal could be sold for great profit over the east in the south. It wasn't a bad plan, truly, but it was not without risks either. I guess I'm going to hold any key. Welcome to the prologue of Vagras, the Riven Realms. It serves as an introduction to the setting and also as a tutorial to the game. It behooves you to read the tutorial text and follow the instructions to gain better understanding of how the game works. Note that although Vagras is an open world game, due to the prologue being a tutorial, it progresses along a narrow guided path at the beginning and opens up only later. Alright, I understand, I understand it. I can appreciate that part. Is This is going to be like one of those open, open style, choose your own path style games at the end of the day. But I totally understand the whole f tutorial being linear thing. All right, on the campaign map, your comitatus always occupies a node and moves between nodes through paths. Moving along paths causes movement points indicated next to each path. Every in-game day, you have a number of movement points to spend before you need to camp. To move, click on a nearby node and select Move from the radial menu. You can select a mode that is further away. The MP cost of moving there will be calculated along the, and the path highlighted. So I'm looking up here. This is basically your money. So I have five Draca, three Bross, seven Lyrg, and they're on a 10 to 10 to 10 gold, silver, copper kind of ratio. I can handle that. Cargo value, I can, I get that. Supplies, I presume that you eat the supplies as you go along. Movement dictates how far you go, and the morale, I understand. All right, so I, I pretty much understand those basic stats. All right, let's move. Having gone ahead of the column with a handful of scouts, you watch from a ridge as your comitatus slowly trudges along, making its way ponderously along dormant geysers and broken terrain. All around you, the hills smolder lazily in the perpetual twilight. Are you all right? Javek's voice resonates sympathy. Excuse me. As I, as I quietly choke up along. Uh, are you all right? Javek's voice resonates sympathy as he appears next to you on the ridge. You nod slowly, but do not look at him. Your gaze lost in the distance where ash cloaks the horizon and the towering mountains to the south and west. Turning to your commies, you notice that his you notice you note his supporting smile. Supportive smile. Ah, I can't read. You and Javik have been traveling around these realms together for years now. There's no other person in the world whom you trust more than you trust him, except perhaps yourself. I know you feel constrained, but I still feel like I said before, you make the right choice by leading us here. So these these kind of events I've seen before just basically choose your own adventure style events. And you can click the choices or just hit numbers. Okay. 
All right. Time will tell, but I still have my doubts. It was a long shot, and you know it. True, but it's just better. It's better than just giving up. The crew agrees too. That counts for something, no? It does. Good to know that they still have faith in me as a Vagdos. They do have faith in you still. It should not come as a surprise, since you've known and traveled with most of them for years and years. Some founding members of the Comitatus could you could trust you with your life, but you have heard stories before about Vagri who have been abandoned for less. Times being what they are, Javik trails off, with Imperials cracking down on us independence more heavily than ever before. Business is tough, everyone knows, and they appreciate your efforts to keep us floating. The plan. So this is where you get the backstory on what your character's plan is. Uh, when a text in an event is highlighted pale blue, it means you have found a codex entry. Clicking on such text opens the codex and navigates you to the entry. I'm not going to click on these. Well, I'm going to click on a few of them just to show them off, but I'm not going to delve deep into each one, even though if I was playing this game properly, I would, but this is just a first impressions kind of thing. It basically gives you a codex entry. I, I almost wish they had pop-ups rather than a full codex, but wow, that's a lot of text. Okay, maybe a full a full codex is, uh, is you know, a full proper book is, is probably best, maybe. Oh, so you can just read them as is. All right, well, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna read it. It's just there, there to help you learn the background. So back to uh, back to the actual description of things. The plan you talked to your traveling company to company to this a few weeks ago, but with each step towards the western mountains, more and more of them started to have doubts, such as the way of the road, perhaps. The plan involves a desperate attempt at squeezing a low selling price for metal bits out of an old contact of yours in the town of Scrap Heap, stocking up on said metal by spending the rest of your coin and bringing the cargo down south along the Molten Tongue to Devon via Avernum and Ash. There's a shortage of metal in Devon, and you know several buyers who give a pretty price for the, your goods if you can only make it there before many others with a similar cargo do. Such contacts are, born, are, a bo are the boon of decades spent on the road. But even if Narbo, that villain, give you an agreeable price in scrap heap, the road is not without its risk. Sneaking through the gap between the dead forest and the molten tongue is inviting disaster, so it's not a course many vagary would take. And of course, if this fails, you have utterly run out of its alternatives. Okay, do you think Nargo will help us out? Um, if he's not willing, we must find a way to compel him. There's no telling what you would be capable of if it came to that. These are dark times and call for desperate deeds, but such thoughts make me really uncomfortable, to be honest. You've seen this expression of his too often not to realize he's using his sorcerer's talent to read your mind. Taking a peek? Apologies, Javak rubs, quickly rubs his eyes and looks away briefly. You know how it is. It comes to me so naturally that sometimes I don't notice I'm doing it. Your thoughts were loud, Vagoras. I have to actually block them, you see. <laughs> yeah, good excuse. After joining your commentators six years ago, Javik proved to be an invaluable asset. Not only does he sense moods and thoughts around him, but he's also able to subtly manipulate others when he focuses his energies. It comes very handy when doing business. Then there's his uh, uh, th excuse me. Then there's his other perks. A few times you found you saw him shatter the minds of men and beasts who tried to kill him. Not a pretty sight, but very effective deterrence. Yet because he's not a trained sorcerer, at least not in the traditional sense, his abilities are sometimes difficult to control. Man, I am I am out of it today. You've become accustomed to his impromptu thought scans, while others find it less bearable to be around him. For this reason, he has kept his abilities a secret for many years overall, but you can't keep a secret such as this in a close-knit community of a comitatus. Especially not if you keep bursting minds and knowing things you shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, I imagine so. Uh, so only a handful of your comies who put up with them, who put up with being near him for long. But even so, he hasn't probed your mind in years. Certainly not on purpose, but neither by accident. Perhaps he's less in control now, which suggests he's more on edge about this whole trip than he lets on. Okay, apologies accepted. Let's return to the others and push on. There's still a day's travel ahead of us. And both of you walk down the comitatus and join the column. I think that was basically like a demeanor type setting. Because that, that was basically choices that show your character's uh, overall, you know, stance on things. 
As we were coming up to the gates of Scrappy, this trash pile of town of cutthroats and scavengers, we would see the vast mountain rangers of shattered Devendor. Thar, oh, just one word, Devendar Thar, looming ominously over the, the horizon, half shrouded in the gaseous vapors belched forth by the volcanoes in the far west. My companions prepared to do their business in town as fast as they could, not wishing to tarry about in this notorious place. Well, certainly got a lot of background. I'm enjoying the music, too. I can zoom in and out. Let's go to Scrap Heap. When a comitatus enters a settlement, you can select from a variety of options, each on its own separate pane, revolving around resting, resupplying, and trading, as well as the opportunity to initiate stories located in the settlement. This time, only the story pane is active. Follow the only available story. Okay. Gee, thanks. At the foot of the ever-fuming mountains of the ancient Dwarven Kingdom lies Scrap Heap, the town of scavengers. Debris and junk and is piled into veritable hills upon which the rickety homes of the decrepit inhabitants stand. Ash lingers everywhere, and the sun is almost always absent from the twilight skies. Deals are struck day and night over the precious metal scraps gathered in the ruins of nearby Dvender Thar, while the Heap King oversees all from his dreaded tower. Soot-covered faces wash from under ash-laden awnings. Life is cheaper than iron here, some say. And iron's supposed to be pretty cheap here, so... I'm off to the stories. You make your way to the Wraith's Stash, a notorious watering hole tucked away in a small street just behind the imposing tower of the Heat King, but not quite under its immense shadow. Not many frequent the establishment, which makes it perfect to Fernarbo and his little operation of honest merchants. Apparently the knave is not only alive, but has done well for himself in the past decade or so. Taking only Javik, you leave the comitatus to take care of Titus, your quartermaster, while you're while you're gone negotiating. To, oh, to the care of Titus, your quartermaster. And you can tell I'm having difficulty reading the screen. <laughs> and it's not the part fault of the game, it's the, far, the fault of my old, old man eyes right now. Ash is flitting from the black sky as you cross the street and nod to the bouncer of the wraith's stash. You give him your sidearms quietly. Rules are rules, at least as long as they can enforce it. Yet they have the courtesy of allowing you to keep your dagger. And, of course, they have no idea what Javik is capable of, should it come to a scuffle. Not that you expect such a thing, but with Narbo, one never knows. Though you've told your crew that him and you go way back, the entrepreneur is a capricious and manipulative man with whom you did not part on the best of terms last time. Does he remember that? Surely. Could he be persuaded to take your proposal? Who knows? Your eyes slowly adjust to the dimness of the tavern's interior. Only a few candles and a lamp at the bar illuminates the common room. Shadowy faces turn towards you and observe you through the thick smoke. The bartender, a thick-set man in a dirty tunic, is chewing tobacco serenely. Above the bar hangs the skeleton of a huge heat lizard, of a large heat lizard on display. Narbo is sitting at a table at the back, his bodyguards half-hidden in the darkness of the wall behind him. All right, make your way confidently towards Narbo. Hmm. I'm going to go to the bar first. I think I'm going to go to the bar first. All right. The bartender stifles a belch and nods his greeting. What can I do for you? The way he grabs an earthenware mug suggests that you would probably do best to order something. You glance at, Jar you glance at Jarvik... Uh, Javik briefly before paying for two rounds of a local mushroom brew called Ash Tongue. It's somewhat less loathsome than you imagined. Leaning over your drink, you quietly tell the barman that you're here to see Narbo. Are you now? He's doing calculations, and he don't like to be bothered when he's doing calculations. He indicates Narbo at the corner table with a nod. The entrepreneur is indeed busy poring over a stack of papers and fiddling with a, cal with a calculus. I'll wait till he's done with his papers. While sipping your beer, you chat with the bartender. Most of it is boring small talk, but when the conversation turns to a discussion of local prices, you notice Javik's stern expression and the small hand gesture he makes. This is a signal you two have been using for a long time now, indicating he's gleaned something from the surface of thoughts of the man. When minutes later the bartender goes to the back to check on the kitchen, Javik leans closer. Apparently there's a supplier of meat and mushrooms that has a surplus on his hands he wants to get rid of quickly. You can't help but smile and nod. This could save you quite a lot of coin. Also, your friend Narbo seems to be having some trouble with a package. In his mind, it is constant frustration in connection to the Heat King. You nod at Javik, and notice how the sleazy merchant has stopped fiddling with the calculus and is now listlessly looking at some papers. It is time. 
Always, always get information. The entrepreneur looks up from a stack of papers in front of him and rubs his eyes. Narbo is a corpulent man with a bushy dark beard and a few missing teeth. Part of his face is covered in scars similar to those left by old burns. That, coupled with the withered and mutated left arm that hangs limp at his side, is a clear indication of the taint. The merchant wears a leather jerkin studded with small bronze and bone coins, a sign of wealth and boldness. His bodyguard, a lean man with tribal tattoos and an outfit made from leather straps, moves his hand calmly to a spear that leans against the wall. Narbo's mouth falls open as the spark of recognition flares up in his eyes. No wonder. It's been ten years. The fuck, mate, he blinks. I thought you croaked. People, um... Narbo waves, waves his good hand around and looks at his bodyguard. Told tales of your demise. The man finishes his sentences for him as the merchant nods vehemently. That business with the Kermak house in the storm, Narbo adds. You tell him that you were indeed at Kermak when the terrible arcane storm struck. You describe the horrors of that night briefly. You add how many of your original comitatus died there. Close friends, old traveling companions, but you walked away unscathed. This was years ago. Sheesh! That fucker Irafons looked after you something fierce, eh? Narbo chuckles heartily. But I'm sure you haven't come to reminisce about old good old times, eh? His predatory smile makes you cautious, even though he invites you to sit down with a casual wave of his meaty hand. All right. I'm going to apologize to him for the unfortunate way you parted ten years ago. Far as I can tell, you never did anything against me, eh? Narbo shrugs with a wry smile. Of course, you could have sent someone to, um, to warn us. The bodyguard finishes the sentence. Back when Narbo and you parted ways, the Avernum Collegium was hot on your trails. They got offended by how, you're too, how you two outplayed them by a smuggling a shipment of exhausted spices without their knowledge and selling it to a local nobleman's merchant house. You look at Narbo and tell him that there's no way of warning him or even knowing where he was after chaos hit following the heist in Avernum. You had to get your crew out of there, so you did. The merchant is thoughtfully fiddling with a stack of papers right by his earthenware coffee cup while listening to you. I appreciate you coming clean, even if this sorry business was so many years ago, he says after a long pause. The bodyguard becomes visibly less tense, but something tells me that ain't all you came for, so what is it? Time to outline your proposition. You explain to Narbo that you want... Ha- oh, wait, there's something in the bottom. Some choices have dependencies, and you can only pick one of a certain choice if you have the right prerequisite. Perks, companions, resources, journal entries, and so forth. Some choices involve tests that can be failed or succeeded with different consequences. Okay, so I've seen this mechanic a lot lately, and I really kind of appreciate it in these text-based, and this is really a text-based game. Um, I mean, I'm sure there's other things beside the text, but it's heavy text-based game. So I appreciate that the the mechanics are something I'm familiar with. All right, you explain to Narbo how you want to give him, you want him to give you a discount on a shipment of metal scraps which you would then smuggle into Devon through contacts that you have in the city's underworld. Once sold, the profit of the shipment would be quite exquisite. You do not name your contact, but divulge divulge enough of her that the plan seems solid. Buyers, you say, are lining up, expecting the shipment soon. Narbo sits in silence, eyes fixed on the table as if listening to some noise from afar. He does not cut you off at any time during your proposition. At length, after you're done, he looks up and gives you a weak smile. That sounds like you've been thinking a long time about it, he says as he shifts in his chair. And it's a great plan, except for the part where I give you a discount for your asking and not much else. And I don't do that, mate. That would make me, uh, what? An almoner, the bodyguard adds discreetly. That a word? Narbo looks up at him. When the man nods, he turns back to you. Aye, an almoner. See, I'm no almoner. You know you gotta do better than that. What you got for me? All right. Um, all right. Let him know that in exchange for his health, you'll help him out with... With a problem he might have now. So that's, that's what I learned at the bar. Narbo's jaw drops when you insinuate that you know about his little problem. Fuck me, mate. You better be connect- you are better connected than I thought. Or you have something up your sleeve, the merchant says as he eyes Javik suspiciously. For a while he's quiet, then he looks up and narrows his eyes. Tell you what, I think we can help each other. You headed to Devon by way of Avernum, I? When you nod, Narbo leans close and signals his bodyguard. The man with the dreadlock steps closer and carefully produces a small packet from behind his leather jerkin. 
or from beneath his leather jerkin, then puts it into the merchant's palm. This here little fellow that you heard of is mighty important to me, you see. If you take this out of the city and deliver it to me, associate in Avernum or even, you'll get your discount scrap from me. The merchant offers you the package. Javik draws in a breath, but before he can speak, Narbo interrupts him. And before a pretty boy here asks, no, I won't tell you what's in it, and don't even think about opening the package. What I can say is it ain't dangerous to to you itself, but um, you might want to keep it hidden from the damn militia of good old crap heap. You take the package. The way Narbo stares at you makes it clear you have no other choice. Certainly. The package is small enough to fit in your palm, feels very light, and is wrapped in fine leather. You pocket it after briefly observing it. You'll be looking for a man named Scorner in out in Avernum. I don't know why I stumbled over pronouncing that. You'll be looking for a man named Scorner in Avernum. He ain't to be trifled with, either. Just tell him I sent you and you'll be fine. You can find him in his men is in Lanvinus rotting watering hole most of the time. Give this little fella to him and to him only, understand? After you assure him that you do, Narbo instructs you to give him an hour, then look for his people at the market and simply introduce yourself. They'll know what price on the metal scraps they should give you by then. He motions to his man. You and Javik step up, stand up, and make ready to leave. Rever, he'll take you to the back exit. We don't want to give people the idea you can come here and beg for almonds now, do we? Or anyone to connect us and run for the militia, for that matter. All right, got what I came for? All right, so I can look in my journal now, which is good, because this is really lore-heavy. In the bottom left corner. Bottom left corner. Oh, there it is. It's in the background. The hell is that? Oh, that's the... That's the codex. And then there's the journal. Okay. So, yeah, it's just basically a, your standard RPG journal. Alright. I need to buy 40 metal sla- scraps at the market. Go to the market district. You and Javik come roam the dingy market district right below the Great Heap upon which the Tower of the Heap King is built. Ash-covered awnings and dirty stalls line the labyrinthine streets, smotheringly narrow alleys, and tiny squares in between them. Sometimes it's difficult to tell a shop from a dilapidated scrap home, and for good reason. Most people who live here are also merchants to some extent. And even though the Heap King's militia is there to keep the peace, you can't help but notice all the shifty gazes from the deplorable types aimed at you. All right. So first of all, I will take a look at uh, local prices and goods. Because I've got to buy 40 40 scrap. After spending an hour looking over the wares of the market, you realize there's nothing there you'd fork uh, coins for. Of course, there are a lot of things that could be useful to you, but if you want, or could be useful, but you want to keep the rest of your purse intact should you run into difficulties on the road ahead. Also, there's a veritable army of cut purses working at the market, and though you've, excuse me, and though you've so far have managed to outsmart them, staying here would tempt fate too much. <laughs> or is there anything else you want to do here? Yes. All right. Find the merchant who's selling cheap supplies. Right. It's not very difficult to find the man with cheap supplies. Javik remembers his face from the memories he saw in Narbo's mind. So it's only a matter of time until he recognizes the merchant. The man looks quizzically af- at you if, after you tell him that you know of his surplus of dried mushrooms and meat slowly going about in his hands. But he does not ask questions. In the end, you manage to haggle for half price. Buy the supplies. You definitely need them. Certainly. Okay. Um... Right. Well, let's uh, let's see about the dwarven curiosities hidden in an alley from years ago. All right, that was a success, but a close one. Eighty-four out of ninety. Now, the small shop is still there at the end of a serpentine alley, running opening from a tucked away square on the south side of the market district. Standing outside of it, you notice how it's a m- in much worse shape than you remember. Inside the decrepit scrap shack is an equally unkempt young fellow who hails you with a jolly smile. The shop looks empty. A short conversation reveals that he's the son of the man who used to run this place. His father never came back from a forage into dwarven ruins a month ago. Unfortunately, I don't have Dad's expertise on dwarves, neither am I the adventurous sort, so by now I've sold all his remaining stock and I'm closing shop soon. Then I'm off and away to the, from Crap Heap for good. 
Go south, maybe to them Dragonland, he says, scratching his beard. You talk a bit about dwarven culture and his father's obsession with their forgotten technological wonders. You're about to say goodbye when he slaps his forehead. I still have something here that a vagrus such as yourself may be interested in. He fishes a small brass compass out of his pocket and hands it to you. It's masterwork, no doubt, sporting runes and detailed etchings on the side. He's willing to sell it to you for a token price. Buy it. Okay, leave the market. Uh, walk to the tower, I guess. Or wait. Here we go. I gotta go to the cargo here. The market pane dis displays the available goods that you can buy at the settlement's market on the right and opens your cargo pane on the left. You can buy goods from the market or sell your own goods from the cargo here. Alright. Shift click to buy a whole stack. Okay. So what have I got in my, my cargo hold? Lots of supplies because I just bought some. But I need to buy scrap metal. So I'll, I, I'm presuming this is where you buy it from. So I will buy 40. Equipment that you can attach to the Comitatus is sold on some markets or found throughout your travelers. They provide bonuses and upgrades. You can switch between the market of goods and equipment using the buttons over the list of items. So I bought 40, so I've finished that particular, that particular, uh, that particular quest. Let's look at equipment. Awnings minus twenty five percent worker consumption. Yeah, I can. I I probably. Yeah, I could do that. I've got a dwarven compass, and I bought it for way less than that. At least I think I bought it for way less than that. Yeah. Well, I will buy awnings because they look relatively cheap. Equipment you own are in a pool below the Comitatus illustration. In order to gain their bonuses, you need to equip them by dragging and dropping them. Okay. So, awnings is a harness. So, it goes over here. Items, the third type of cargo, not to take up space and are not equipable. They are used and traded in certain events. You can switch panes in the settlement, etc., etc. So let's look at Dwarven Compass. There we go. And that could have been equipped over here, too. Interesting. And you know what? I'm going to buy more scrap metal than that. I'm going to be a little bit proactive there. Perhaps it's time to visit the Heap King. Walking up the Great Heap to the immense tower is a daunting task. Up the hill it is even more difficult to breathe than the ash-choked city at its feet. A hot wind blows from the south. Every step is slow torture. By the time you reach the gates of the tower, your chest is heaving and you keep coughing up soot. Before you rises the Tower of the Heap King, ruler of this trash pile of a town. The whole structure is cobbled together from scrap, with the lower levels covered in metal sheets. A huge bon bone fire should be bonfire of yellow white flame burns on its top level day and night, a beacon for the scavenging teams to follow home. Looking nigh impregnable, the pregnable, the v fortress has only one entrance. A small group of guards sneer malevolently at you as you approach. Better turn back if you've got no business here, a vagabond, the ranking gatekeeper says from under a mask attached to his bronze skull cap. Um yeah, I've got nothing to say that would gain entry, so I'm going to head out then. So what do I do when I'm done? With all your business here concluded, packed up, and restocked on supplies, you finally make ready to leave the decrepit town of Scrap Heap behind in the morning. You spend the night within the guarded compound, and it is not for free, though. Alright, you set out at dawn. Ash is flitting from the sky, and the distant mountains rumble ominously in the morning twilight as your comitatus reaches the west gates of town. Almost immediately, you notice that guardsmen and militia at the gates are working in groups, questioning and inspecting travelers. Even if they are looking for the package Narbo gave you, you realize there is a minuscule chance of finding it among several departing caravans, all made of dozens of people, respectively. Besides, the packet is tiny and well hidden at the bottom of a sack of dried mushrooms. A road magistrate of the Heap King appears to coordinate the search effort, picking out people or whole traveling groups for inspection. 
As your commentatus draws near, it takes only a passing glance from him to appraise you and your crew before he motions to the guards to let you through. The commentatus is well on its way and scrap heap a mere dot on the horizon by the time Javik joins you at the front of the line. Just like I said, you made the right choice with this venture. Talk of how you may have saved us all is spreading like wildflower. Flyer. Wildfire, he says. I don't know why I kept on wanting to say wildflower there. What the fuck? Anyway, he says with a faint smile, Of course, we do have to make it alive all the way to Drevin with a cargo, but it's a good start, don't you think? All right. I agree, there may be hope left in the Comitatus after all. Well, I'm sure it'll be fine. It's not like we started with this business yesterday. With that, you go. You both go back to your own duties and the constant monitoring of the horizon. If all goes well, you'll reach the Wound in a few days, where you can turn south along the edge of the Molten Tongue and travel down to Avernus. Okay. In the prologue, your progress is saved at checkpoints like it has just been saved now. Okay, I can handle that. Hmm. I meant to read that, but I left the key down. Oh well. Oh well, can't have been that important. The crew management UI is now active. Click, click on the sheet in the top left corner to activate it. The crew management window allows you to manage your comitatus. Morale is the general mood of your comitatus, ranging from 1 to 9. Low morale applies penalties to MPs and tests and events. If it ever drops to 1, there's a chance the comitatus dissolves and you lose the game. Vigor indicates how tired your comitatus is. Low vigor results in penalties and tests and dramatically, dramatically and drastically slower comitatus. Okay. So my current... Oh, crap. More. Upkeep is how much you owe your crew. You can pay them at the end of each day or keep collecting debt. Consumption is how many, how many supplies your crew consumes each day. Running out of supplies leads to quick death in the wasteland. Passengers or people your comitatus takes to their destination for rewards. Yeah, that's not bad. Oh, more. Here you can see the number of each crew and beast type you have in your commentatus. Consult the tooltip for each type to learn more about the role. Outriders are special because you need a fighter and a mount to be able to create an outrider by using the plus button. While outriders are excellent fighters, mounts with outriders can carry cargo. You can always dismount fighters using the minus button. For an add, out, add or an, an outrider. Okay, so I will add an outrider. Then close this window by clicking the X on the top right. So up here. But before I do, I'm going to look at this. There's a wandering old man who is a passenger. I have no idea who that is. Uh, there's crew vigor. They're well rested. They're steady morale. Upkeep is okay. I mean, how do I pay it? I guess that, that's something for the tutorial later. I mean, I can easily pay the one day. Yeah, let's let's close that for now. Continuing to head south, and I could, I guess, just continue onward. I've got four more movements, so I can only really go one more. You've run out of movement points and need to camp, ending the day, being on the road all day. Uh, lowers the vigor of your comitatus that you can replenish by camping. You can also camp earlier than running out of MPs, which helps raise vigor faster. Okay. So you click on what you're, what you're currently occupying and then camp. At the end of each in-game day, the comitatus makes camp and settles down for the night. Uh, you have the option to give out less or more supplies under rations with penalizers to boost vigor and morale, respectively. Um, starving your crew will have long-term negative effects but as well, but it may be necessary sometimes to save rations. Each day you can offer normal or double wages for the current day, independent of whether you pay them or not. Double payment increases morale. You can also choose to pay all your debts with your crew at this time, or accrue payments, but the longer you delay, the grumpier they will get. You can also talk to your companions and heal them using the icons below their portraits. Additionally, you can set your defense orders for the night. A more lenient defense has a higher risk of nighttime ambush. So first of all, I will I will do normal daily upkeep and I will pay now. Uh, consumption, I'll do 100% consumption. Um, and who do I have here? Do I need to heal either of these? 
I don't I don't think I need to heal anybody. Excuse me. Uh I will post guards. Because you never know what can uh, ambush you out in the wastelands. And then I guess the next day we continue onward. One, two, three on the node. And am I done for the day? Yeah, after camp. Once again, I will. I will pay now and end the day. After a long day's march under the bleak skies and harassed by hot winds, the Comitatus finally settled down in a wide ravine. After taking care of camp chores and checking on all your commies, you, uh, you yourself go to your tent and tuck in for the night. There are benefits to sleeping out in the wasteland. The silence is quite calming, tranquil even. Only the murmur of the distant fire-belching mountains, the whisper of wind, and the occasional groans of your beast can be heard. Except, something is making a muffled noise you don't recognize. Your eyes flick open, there's something wrong. You rise to check it out. Leaving your tent and passing the sleeping beast, you are about to call out to a guard when you stumble upon a large quadrupedal creature with fused bone protrusions. It's munching on supplies scattered across the ground, evidently from a torn open sack lying nearby. The creature is a Jacra, a wasteland scavenger that hunts in packs. Before you can utter a word, the monster charges you, and out of the shadows. And out of the shadows, Morwen leaps at it, tackling it aside and cutting its hide with her bone axe in a follow-up swing. You breathe out, realizing how she has probably saved your life. Javik runs to you just as the creature backs off, letting out a long howl. There's more of these accursed things, boss. They must have sneaked inside the camp past the perimeter guards. We were f we are fighting them and chasing them off, he blurts out. As he does, you can hear yelling and the sounds of a battle from around the camp. The wounded Jacra is joined by another one from behind a cargo pile, and the two of them start circling you. All right. So I guess this is a combat. Companion combat is turn-based, where one to six enemies fight against your team of one to six companions. You can use the skills of your companions to defeat your enemies, etc., etc. Made of rounds, the take turns to act. Uh, friendly size, pretty standard here. Each row has three positions. I can see that. Okay, begin fight. The order in which the combatants uh, receive receive their turns is about according to initiative. So there's an initiative up here. So one of them is going to go first. Ouch! Melee skills can only be used from the front row. That's uh, why Morwin is there. She's kind of just got horns, man. Some sort of mutant. Uh, they can only target front row enemies that are adjacent to the attacker's position, or back row enemies if the no real front row enemies block them. Okay, so she's actually got to move. If they move into a position that's occupied by another character, etc., etc. Um, when you want to select the move icon in position by okay, confirming it. So she's going to move to there. Each companion has four combat skills beside move, represented by a row of icons below their name. Okay, okay. Pretty simple. Mind blast. That's his thing. And he just kind of psionically blasts it. Boom! Miss! Although it did send it back. Okay, you can consult the combat log to see what occurred. The character sheet can be opened by clicking this icon. Forfeit button if the character allows you to pass your current turn. But I don't need to pass. I need to do more damage. What do I have? Hypnosis. Okay, a single target moves to where you command it. No, I don't think so. I'm going to try Mind Blast again. Here we go. Boom! That one's gone. This thing's gonna move up. She is going to... You know, that's a good question. What is she going to do? She's gonna move to there. And he... is going to move this thing back. Wait, hypnosis? Missed. <laughs> yeah, this is pretty pretty standard combat for an RPG. It's, it's not too out of the way. Now, he's got five vitality. Do these things require... Yeah, these two things require power, not vitality. So he's got six more. 
Let's just do Mind Blast. Man, why does why is Morwen not able to attack? I just got a devastating blow here. Evasion. This thing is brutal. Oh my god, why do I hire you? I should rename her Roderick. Man, this guy's got low vitality and low power. Boom. And another Mind Blast. And he's done. It's attack It's able to attack him because she's not in front of him. Oh my god. Well, at least it's attacking Morwen. Morwen is got more hit points, I guess. There we go. Well, that was actually pretty brutal, man. My, my Scion almost died. The two chakra lie dead at your feet. Morwen wipes the foul-smelling blood from her axe blade as a guard arrives and talks to her. You okay, boss? Javik pats you on the shoulder. You nod, turning to Morwen as she approaches you. All hostiles taken care of, she says. They got some of the, to some of the food, but we can take their meat and parts to make up for it. Harvest the damned critters before going back to bed. Perhaps you'll even gain something from this. Yeah. Plus 90 supplies, plus 2 ivory, and plus 5 beast hides. So what does that actually give you? What What is the... Uh, let's see, see what we got. Plus 5 beast hides and some ivory. Plus 2 ivory. So I guess those are things that I can sell to people. So let's move onward. Your chart is now active, opening it by clicking the chart top right corner. Chart is your tool in navigating the wastelands of Zarin and planning your journeys. You can move around by holding the left mouse button and moving the mouse, etc., etc. You can mark, uh, after discovering a settlement or point of interest that can be marked, you can mark it, which highlights it on the chart. I'm supposed to be going to the wound and then down to Avernum. Okay. Okay. Alright, how do I get out of here? Oh no! Give me the tutorial. How? Uh, Alright, and then close it. Mark a vernum, and then close it. Okay, a vernum. I'm supposed to mark that one. Now I can close it. Teach me to read. <laughs> Damn. Forced March allows you to move further than your maximum movement points in a given day. Forced March movement using marching, marching MPs, marching along paths, and at, at, at its cost as indicated by red on the campaign map. Although forced marching gets you further, use them carefully. Your clue loses vigor and even morale rapidly if you march too often without extra rap resting. We strongly suggest you refrain from frequent forced marching until you have more experience. I don't think I'm going to force march. I'm, I'm just going to... I'm going to pay these guys now. And I'm going to try and heal companions. Let's treat Javik. I will use medical supplies. I will treat Morwen. Uh, I don't know how many medical supplies I've got. Oh. How many medical supplies do I have? Medical, I've got eight medical supplies. Okay. There we go. Nobody for now. I will end the day. And I am running out of, uh, of cash. As the Comitatus is scaling another stretch of black sand and uh, black sand dunes, one of the outriders you had sent out to screen your left flank rides in on the line and heads immediately to you. You can see the man is in panic right away from the way he hops off the saddle while decelerating and almost falls over. Before he reaches you, your guardsman is already setting up a defensive perimeter to the east. You beckon to the beast drivers to halt the line. Vagris, they are coming. I saw him walking over the dunes. The pilgrims are coming. 
A murmur of terror washes over the Comitatus. Clearly, your scout was referring to the last pilgrimage. This group of spectral horrors is known are known to appear out of nowhere and eradicate even large groups of travelers in a matter of minutes. No one quite knows what happens to those who encounter them up close, but as no one has lived to tell the tale. Some reckless people were reputedly able to take a peek at the otherworldly wayfarers, but during your many years as a Vagris, you have never met any such person whose story was credible. You know all too well that if your outrider tells the truth, and you've seen no reason why he wouldn't, the only chance of survival is for all of you to run or to hide. Um, you know what? Let's try to place, uh, try to hide from them. Outriders you had sent westward report that there's a rocky area not far away. After heading west for a quarter of an hour in great haste, the Comitatus finds a stretch of badlands crisscrossed by shallow ravines. The jagged, tall rock formations here are half covered in the fine black sand of Arenas Negras. Already, the scouts are busy setting up hiding places among the rocks and gullies. In a matter of minutes, you are all behind cover. Everyone settles down and either prays to whatever gods they believe in or prepares for a desperate last stand. But what about you? There's a chance now to take a look at the last pilgrimage from up close. No, surely it would not It would be insane to attempt such a thing. Or would it? Are you, as you are pondering this, the wind picks up from the northeast, carrying with it clouds of black dust, the perfect cover for spying. I'm, I'm going to creep along the dunes under the cover of the storm and try to take a peek at them. Sure, why not? Just, just you know, put it out there. It takes ten minutes in this f for this feeling of what you are doing is utter madness to settle in. By then, you and the scout are creeping forward in the dust storm. Why? Why did I bring a scout with me? What? What? What was it? That scout? Like, oh, you know, this, this is, this is deadly. But I'm going to go ahead and hang out with you. No. Wow. Anyway, going is tough, despite wearing hoods and scarves to protect your faces and eyes. But you make it to the dunes through which the pilgrimage is expected to move. After ten more aggravating minutes, a dull light appears over the dunes to your left. As it gets closer, it is revealed to be a blanket of white-yellow radiance that covers a shambling assembly of sickly figures. They cross the dunes not fifty yards from where you're hiding, but due to the awful dust and the eerie light, you cannot make out much. They appear to be men of sorts, or at least humanoid, wearing long robes that remind you of old depictions of pre-calamity clergy. Some of them lean on staves. A faint chanting is on the wind, and both of you are struck by a weird sensation— like when someone steps on your grave. Strange images infringe upon your peripheral vision. Upon you peripheral visions. Upon your peripheral visions. Elusive and unformed. The otherworldly congregation passes in what feels like hours, yet only minutes have passed, and takes the dust storm with them. Wearily, you walk back to the rest of your people. Some people talk of strange images passing before their eyes, like walking dreams, while the pilgrimage was close by. The comitatus ponderously digs itself out of black sand and dirt. You're ready to depart in half an hour. Most of your commies are hushed and keep an eye on the horizon and you for days to come. All right. Minus one morale, minus one move. Eh. Am I going to get a day? I'll pay him. I'm going to pay him now. So the morale is distressed. They're not at one yet. They are fatigued. Let's get there. I'm wondering, can we force march? Let's let's force march. Well, how far away am I? I'm gonna have to start putting putting some money away for. I, I've got no money. That's the problem. Camp again. I'm gonna have to pay later. I don't have the money to pay him right now. End the day. They are exhausted. The Comitatus climbs the last black dune and comes to a halt on your mark. Standing on one of the carts, you spy the, hori you spy the horizon carefully before copying down and convening with your most trusted. Ahead looms the voiceless, the voiceless lake, a place of deathly quiet and utter peril. The lava flow of this particular tendril of the molten tongue cools down here enough here below a tough shell of dark rock covered by steaming water. Yet the shell is not solid enough in places. It can crack in the blink of an eye and open under one's foot leading into a sudden, scalding death. There are ways to guess where it's safe to cross the terrain, but it has to be done slowly and attentively. Your scouts know their way around here, but because the lava changes constantly beneath the shell, they have to rely on finding a new way through each time. The lake, the lake is voiceless because everyone has to keep some completely quiet. That way, one might hear the shifting lava and the cracking shell just in time. Your lieutenants agree that crossing the, f the far side is still better than going around and into Arenas Negras. 
however, especially after coming so close to the last pilgrimage a few days ago. Nobody in their right mind would go near the damn place. You're, so you're stuck with a plateau surrounding the voiceless lake. So I will try to cross over carefully. That was a success, going step by step, carefully listening to any telltale sounds while sweating profusely. Each member of the comitatus manages to make it through. After hours that felt like days, you can turn away and southwards from the accursed lake. The crew becomes agitated as you leave the perilous plateau behind, even joking among themselves about the constipated silence back there. Alright. Let's keep going. Just as we were about to leave that damnable lake behind, we heard it. An abominable shriek pierced the air and made us gasp. It came from behind some hills nearby, coupled with the ruckus of a battle. The armed woman and men of the Comitatus looked at their Vagras questioningly. Scouts come running toward the cart line as you are about to enter the badlands south of the lake and hear what can only be described as a paralyzing howl, accompanied by the unmistakable clash of weapons. There's a battle going on, Vagras, just beyond yonder hills. Some armed folks are being attacked by the bloody undead. A murmur washes over the crew, and many of them ready their weapons. Not to give aid to fellow travelers in dire need is believed to attract dire peril unto yourself. Besides, it would be better to fight the undead together than alone if it comes to that. Um, let's, let's see exactly. Ask the scouts exactly what they saw. There were four guys clad in dark metal weapons, uh, but they were losing about half a dozen shamblers or so, one of them huge. Uh, or, alright, um, rush in and attack the undead. You clamber over the next few hills and happen upon the sight of a brutal melee. Bodies are strewn across the field, most of them mutilated undead, but some are mangled in burnt humans and dark clothes. Another such man, a robed priest with a shaved head, falls to the ground after flying half a dozen meters following a bone-crushing hit from a looming white giant. The, creature's, the creature looks like it's made from several bodies, fused together by some combination of natural disaster and evil curse. The rest of the shamblers look like they are smoldering. The great white abomination faces the last two men standing. A white-faced, lightly-armored enforcer with a shield and a tall man in elaborate black armor, wielding a greatsword. Both of them look worse for wear. So let's go in. So these are two people that are not mine. Before the first round is started, you have to deploy your companions to available positions on the friendly side. All right, you can. Let's let's do that then. And we can begin the fight. Oh oh oh! He's he got taken out right away. Some. Some skills can target friendly units to support, protect, or even heal them. In this fight, a lot of Javik's skills cannot be used because of the undead enemies or immune to mind-affecting effects. Javik is far from useless, however, as you can use his premonition skill to keep his allies buffed with additional initiative, accuracy, evade, and block. Buffs do not stack, but are refreshed when cast. Let's, uh... Buff my person. Okay. So, I'm going to try and take these guys, take these people down ASAP. Let's hit this and then move there. That only hit one of them. Sidarius is a very tough companion to his armor in good defense. His skills also include support skill that enhances his stats and one that debilitates an enemy. You know, I hate to say it, but I hope that that one that instantly died wasn't wasn't absolutely uh, required. You got Unholy Strike. You got Cleave, which strikes two adjacent enemies in the front row. You got Vengeance, which receives bonus damage and initiative. Yep, he's going to buff himself. Now I can try and hit a couple with a cleave. Oh no, more wounds hit. Alright, you, the Vargas, may not pay, take part directly in companion combat, but that does not mean you have no means to influence. Many of your leadership perks allow you to use resourcefulness in various ways in combat. You have two options for now. Aid, which allows you to revive down companions and Empower, which gives power to the target. So I'm going to use Empower to give ja Javik power. 
So how do I do that? It's up here. Empower to give Javik power. But he doesn't need power. I need to revive the one that died. Okay, he's going to try and use uh, premonition on this guy. Who is then going to use cleave? And miss. <sighs> and this one is going to use strafe. Okay, here. Strafe on this and then move to there. Boom. Come on. Can I use Inspire? No, I can't yet. Not my turn yet. Still not my turn. I can't use Inspire. It requires two resourcefulness. I don't know that I have it. Actually, I don't know if you can actually revive the one that got insta-ganked. I'm going to go up here. Well, we got one of them now. I'm gonna go devastating blow, take two of them down. And now we just got that big thing to deal with. Let's try and take it down. Try and refresh his buffs. Oh no! Well, she can't. Oh, she got crit. Oh no! Refresh his buffs. I guess his vengeance wore off. And bring it back up again. I think we can do this. Not if he just flat out kills Morwen, though. Mind Blast is not going to be able to hit this thing. Yeah, it's immune. Well, it blocked one. Oh no. Come on. Take this thing down. So the thing should be almost dead. So you can stick them into various defensive modes. But I don't know if that's... If, I think that it may be affecting the accuracy, too. This thing has to go down soon, please. More winds down! No! I'm going to change defense mode. No, I'm not. All right. Can I bring that one back? I'm going to aid her. He's basically going to uh Can I can I just Does he have an option to just skip? Yeah, skip active turn. Cuz he can't really do much. Everybody's buffed and it's just a power sink from now on. What the hell? What the hell? She just stood up. I mean, it looks like she's... She's still alive. Come on, take this thing down. 
She just got knocked down. That's what the issue was. Wait. And have him finish it off. Come on. Victory, but at what cost? It's over. The undead finally stops moving. Their bo bodies lying mutilated all around the hills. The large abomination was hacked to pieces. Now only a jumbled pile of ash and petrified bones. Some of your crew also got torn up. There are several wounded and one dead. His head torn off after he had been overpowered. The man in the black armor survived the battle. He is sitting on a rock nearby, covered in ash from the abomination, drinking ponderously from a water skin while he is observing the battlefield. His grim gaze wanders from one slain companion to the other, as if wanting to make sure all of them are dead. At length, his piercing eyes find you. A chill runs down your spine in spite of the brutal heat. There's no doubt in your mind that the man in you need to talk. Standing in front of the man, you offer him your hand. The man looks up and he looks you up and down in a fashion that suggests only a dash of contempt. His great sword, forged of steel, is across his lap. He does not take your hand. You seem the leader of this. You seem to be the leader of this. The man is looking for the word as he eyes the comitatus company of travelers. What is your business here? The bluntness of the question, coupled with the man's apparent hostility and ungratefulness, hits you, leaving you speechless. Perhaps it is for the best. You notice that the man is bearing the symbol of Sergarod, which should make you cautious. All right, I'm traveling Comitatus, traveling south. I see, so your turning up here is a matter of utter coincidence, I take. When you assure him it is, he narrows his eyes and pierces you with his gaze. There's a tense moment that seems to take forever. You are truthful, Vargas. Commendable. The man rises from the rock. He towers over you now, and it dawns on you that such a war with that such a war, a war gear in the metal star of world makes him either a very rich or a very powerful person, or both. I am grateful for your assistance in this skirmish, late as it was. The man turns to look at Javak, who appears by at your side and bows his head to the man. Without acknowledging your friend or his greeting, the armored fellow turns to you again. My name is Sidarius. I am a knight of Ordus Negras Solus. By aiding me, Vargas, you have aided Imperial Law. You clearly have some questions of your own. Now is your chance to ask them. Best not to wake him, make him wait. Um, ask him about what he was doing here. I and my companions came in search of enemies of the Empire to smoke them out of their hideout here in the wilds. It was supposed to be the last glorious battle in a long investigation that took months. As you can see, it went down quite differently. It is now my assumption that we've been betrayed and a trap was set for us. The traitors we were supposed to apprehend lured us here along with these undead and hoped to see us all slaughtered. Sergarod, however, in his endless salience saw fit to grant us, well, grant me, an opportunity for retribution. Rejoice, Vagras. You have been an instrument of the divine, sent here by Sergarod himself to aid me in my quest for vengeance. Anything else you wanted? Um, what about his companions? Oh, ask him what he plans to do now. Yeah. I intend to return to Avernum, where we sit out from. I have to debrief my superiors there of what happened today, and I also want to look into the tip we received that led us here. Sidarius fixes you with his gaze. Your destination does not happen to be Avernum, does it? You can't help but tell him the truth. You are too well aware that lying to one of the Knights of the Black Sun is high treason. It is the first time you see Sidarius' malevolent smile. Good, I shall join you for the journey. Irafans teaches us to share the burdens of the road. Now tell your men to pile the bodies of my companions. Burning their bodies without the proper rituals is not becoming of such heroes of the Empire, but we have no time for much else. Also, gather all their belongings while you're at it. Make it happen, Vagras. In the meantime, someone skillful enough should take a look at my wounds. You're about to leave to make the necessary arrangements when Sidarius calls after you. And just so everyone knows, the danger might still be looming over us. The traitors who are supposed to find and set the trap must still be around here, keeping a distance. They surely would have finished me off when, when I had slain all the undead. I doubt they are going to make a move now, but who knows what their desperation will drive them to. Though your crew does not like to be ordered around by a stranger, they too agree that the slain shall be dealt with. I like the atmosphere of this game. I really, I, I really do. As the Kamatatis is crossing into the Badlands, you climb onto the cart where the resting Sidarius is sitting in the back. You can see that he's holding something small in his hands, observing it attentively. He looks up, sensing you watching him. This is a fetish charm, one that the, the kindly sisters and the disciples of Ashkul used to attract the, re the reanimated dead. The knight tosses you 
a small bone charm complete with arcane writing and black ink and attached teeth. I disabled it. Do not worry. These filthy traitors may have used a stolen charm to ensnare my contingent, but I am anointed in the faith of Ashkel. I swear they will suffer for this atrocity. You give the charm back to the knight. There's also the manner of the belongings of my fallen com com comrades. I expect you to hold on to them until we reach Avernum. We'll discuss them there. All right, so... Uh, the Dark Knight joined with us after we rescued him with the clutches of the mindless undead horrors. He was a grim sort, displaying no gratitude or companionship, yet we were stuck for him. All right, so on to Avernum, which I hope I can get... Click on the, the to open the leader window. See, here's the thing. This is going a little longer than I fully intended it to, but it ever it's slowly introducing the concepts of the game, and I appreciate that. Okay, bottom left corner on the medallion to open the leader window. Uh, the Vagras. Your current insight is displayed on the top right. Insight is gained mainly through events. It can be used to purchase perks and other improvements. So I've got 55 Insight. Perks are abilities that have levels and are used in various situations. Okay, so these... Uh, you can purchase any number of perks if your Insight allows you by clicking on the empty nodes next to each perk representing its level. Okay. So what I'm going to do... Okay, this is actually interesting. Uh, there's professions, and then there's attributes, and then there's these. So these are your basic stats. Uh, insights, basically your experience. Authority and resourcefulness are your basic stats. And then these are, are kind of your perks. And these are your attributes. So I'm going to boost charismatic. If I can, can can I? No, I can only do, I can only do perks right now. Um, I'm gonna use, I'm, and I can only do like one of them. In fact, it's only letting me do one of them. Damn it! Click on the helmet icon on the leadership medallion to navigate to the companions pane. And this is where I can. I can level up people here. Equip Morwen with a Luck Talisman gear. Drag and drop into an empty gear slot. And click on the laurels at the top of her image. So, right. Alright. This is the prowess window where you can upgrade your companions. Uh, so this is how you upgrade your companions. And you use insight from the leader. So so you only get one pool of insight for everybody, and you use that to upgrade not only your leader, but the companions. Okay, then. Um, so upgrade one of your companions' prowess and perch any, perch any perks or skills that you'd like. So it gives her 40 proficiency, which is then used for things. I'm going to boost her mightiness. I'm going to boost her toughness. And I'm going to boost her devastating blow. No, I can't. I will boost her toughness again. I will boost her mightiness again. All right. Because she's my main combat fighter here. My people are exhausted. So I will have to make camp and I will have to pay later again. Okay. The whole comatose becomes agitated as the dust cloud appears in the east and starts to move towards you. You give orders to your crew to prepare for, prepare for a dust storm. Make the necessary arrangement. Head on southwards. Okay. Oh no, these guys again. No, no, wait, wait, it's different. 
After half an hour, the cloud is much closer and is certain that it will cross your path. By then, everyone is wearing protective masks or bandanas, and all the cargo and equipment is secured. Javik is riding a large beast of burden fastened to its back, deep in concentration to maintain the calmness of all your animals. But something is off. An uncanny twilight is settling on the broken plains around you. It is much too early for sunset, and the storm itself should bl not blot out light in such a manner. And then you hear it, chanting, chanting on the wind, and a pale light in the heart of the storm heading your way. You can see the faces of the crew slowly distorting in a panic. Try to flee as fast as you can. You... Um, you were just about to give the order when Sidarius walks up to you. What is the meaning of this, Vagris? There's no need for such a desperate act. It is just a dust storm. You quickly tell him about your previous encounter with the last pilgrimage. Nonsense. The chances that the pilgrimage would show up again are Sidarius trails off as the eerie twilight falls upon the Comatatus and the dust envelops you all. There's no time to flee or hide, so you signal everyone to draw weapons and stand at the ready. Some of your crew tremble, some are praying, and some are about to break, but not Sidarius. The knight walks towards the approaching apparition as if being possessed by a death wish. You see Javik, frowning and sweating in concentration, no doubt trying to calm your beast's natural instinct to flee in terror. In a few moments, you can hear the chanting and see the ghastly pilgrims clearly through the dust curtain. Desiccated forms and faded ro robes shuffling along the broken terrain. Or rather, over the terrain somehow, as if floating along at an enhanced pace. Man, this this guy has got some got some stones. Man, he he just walks right up to them. Before they would reach you, without any apparent reason, the spectral pilgrims turn left and head south along a dried out riverbed. It takes your mind some min some minutes to comprehend that an unusual mercy was granted you and your crew. It takes a good few moments for the for the crew and yourself to come to your senses. Did that really happen? What was the reason? So Darius walks over to you looking confident, though you can see he is a bit shaken too. Sir Garad is with us. This is an omen if I have ever seen one. My destiny for retribution against the enemies of the Empire must be the reason why these horrors let us be. You swallow and nod, yet you are not certain why it happened the way it did. Rest assured, Vagros, until you have me by your side no uh, uh, until you have me by your side, as long as you have me by your side. Okay. Plus five insight, still uh, still rattled, you move along the line, assuring everyone the danger has passed. After an hour or two, your crew fall back to your travel routines. I'm just I'm just kind of skimming over this because I kind of need to uh I'm gonna, I'm gonna force march. A little bit more. They are fatigued. But I need to get there. Oh no, they're exhausted and they're shattered. Ill fed? I don't have any rations. Oh no! Oh my god! I can't even get to a Vernum. Come on, one more day! They're near dead. Got lost in the damn wilderness. I can't even move! Oh no! I've got no rations, they're near dead. Try and get a little bit- squeeze out a little bit- oh, oh my god! The Vargas was was right there. Oh wait, wait here. Uh, not Vargas. Why, why did I say that? Avernus was right there. The Comatatus climbs a broken ridge, and everyone stops a moment to take a visit of Avernum. Nestled atop and around a range of lar hills, large hills several miles to the southwest, the chimneys of the many forges and smelters cast a dark shadow over the city, while the lava fields beyond the settlement provide a reddish sky for backdrop. It appears that crude rains meander over the hills. Time for us to part ways, Vagros. The voice of Sidarius makes you jump a little. For a large fellow wearing heavy armor, he managed to creep up in you somehow. He's standing beside you, gazing at the horizon. I have to make my way into the sea alone. My reasons are my own. But before I go, I have a proposition for you. Okay. You are well aware, of course, that my contingent was betrayed and ambushed out in the wasteland where we met. During our trek back here, I have come to the conclusion that whoever betrayed us had somehow in had to be somehow involved in the investigation I led in Avernum before setting out from the city. Even though... Oh, excuse me. Even though I have some ideas where to start looking for traitors, the implication is a despicable betrayal 
are too severe to abrupt and to attempt meeting it head on. I require secrecy and guile. Most of my remaining allies in the city and I are too easy to track or recognize. So, so you, your friend mage, and the rest of your crew could be vital in finding the culprits and bringing them to justice. The Empire needs your help. Um, sure. What kind of uh, what kind of assistance does he require? I need someone who is not known to have cooperate to have cooperated with the previous investigation is not. Associated with me publicly, I need someone to spy on and gather information on suspected officials and criminals while I coordinate the investigation from a hidden base of operations. Sure. Uh, I'll agree I'll agree to help the Empire. Yeah. Sadaria seems to be somewhat surprised, perhaps disappointed even for a brief moment. Then he flashes what passes for a smile on him. Um, very well, I was nurturing hope that you'll be willing to aid the Empire in this perilous predicament. We will struggle side by side, just like we did near the Voiceless Lake, Vagras. And I can assure you, the Order of the Black Sun does not forget loyalty and dedication to the Empire. So what's his plan? The plan for now is to make our ways into Avernum separately, so you won't be associated with me at all. Uh, you ask him about the belongings of his former comrades, the Knight Frowns. That might complicate matters somewhat. Take their holy symbols to the Temple of Sagarod quietly. You can get rid of the weapons as you see fit, but I forbid selling them on the markets. It would draw too much attention to you, and we do not want that for now. All right. Last stretch for the city awaits you. And uh dark omens, ominous apparitions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm kind of, I'm kind of scurrying cuz I am way out of time. Let's go to let's go to Avernum. And let's uh enter enter it. Okay, I will pay the pay the gate tax. I had I had two lurg. I had just enough. Having passed under the wall through the city gate, you manage you arrive at the cobbled plaza with inside on the inside. Without delay, you head towards the mansio, the large inn for Kamatati, to set yourself up there and have some rest after the arduous journey. In an hour, everything is settled. Your beasts are stabled. Your cargo is unloaded into a warehouse, and most of your crew is resting already. Javik approaches you and draws you aside. There's someone here to see you, boss. Someone sent by our knightly friend. Says she wants to talk to you discreetly. She's waiting behind the stables. It is foolish to think that you'd rid yourself of Sidarius and his agenda, but you have little choice. The woman waiting for you in the shadows behind, between the stables and the wall of the mansion is wearing a large hood and a long cape of dark gray over a dark gray featureless tunic. As you approach the though, she throws her, the hood back, revealing the markings of someone in the service of Ashkel, god of the underworld. A face painted pale with dark eye shadow to give the impression of near death and a small skull pendant. You suspect that she's a novice attached to the Order of the Black Sun or an acolyte of the Church of Ashkel. The woman looks around furtively. There's nobody nearby, just you and Javik. Greetings from our mutual friend, the knight, Dominus. The young woman says quietly after looking you in the eye. I was sent here to take you to him when you're ready. I'll wait here. Just don't take too long. He's very eager to see you. So it would seem that we'll stay here longer than we'd expected. It occurs to me that such a delay would be a strain on our resources, and I rather doubt that our knightly friend cares about that. Um... I was thinking that we could smelt the scrap metal we bought. I know it would cost us, but hear me out. Not only does smelted metal take up less space in the cargo hold, it could allow us to sell a fraction of it for great profit. It's a loss in the long run, but we have to pay the crew if we are to tarry here, don't we? You have to melt. He admit he's making a lot of sense. You could smelt down the metal and sell off, sell some of the bars for an injectional coin if need be. All right. So first of all, let me see. Um, my pe This is basically the last thing I'm going to do here. Is I'm I'm not, I'm not going to go through the through the story of the city, but I am going to see about raising some cash. So I've got pretty much to sell. Let's look at cargo. I can sell some beast hides. I've got. That'll bring bring me a little bit of coin. And then where's the ivory? I can sell some ivory. And then he talked about about uh, about smelting down the arms. Oh, smelt down the arms and armor of the dead Sergeradites. Let's smelt metal scraps. Let's smelt down the arms and armor of the dead Sergradites. 
And then let's, uh, I already did that. Wait, what? It's, it's letting me do that multiple times? <coughs> Excuse me. I don't know if that's a bug or whether I've just got multiple... Do I have multiple arms and armor of the dead Sergrodite? Oh, I've got one more. Okay. Let's deliver the belongings of Sidarius' dead companions. Give the priests the holy symbols only. The priest growl a short blessing and assure you that Sergorod will not forget you're returning the belongings of his lost servants. So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave the temple. And then I will continue to smelt the scraps into ingots. Smelt metal scraps. And that's all I can do, really. Leave the foundries and then we'll go ahead and sell stuff. So what can I sell? I can sell some not scrap metal. Although that is a little bit of a profit. That is a bit of a profit. Let's sell some iron. And let's sell some copper. All right. So that's basically how you operate here is you can go ahead and um and buy and basically buy low, sell high and then you interact with various story elements. I'm going to cut it here, though. This has been the RPG Crawler with my first look at Vagrus. And, and um, you know what? I'm going to tell you what I think of the game. I'm liking the music. I'm liking the atmosphere. I'm really liking the story time. Storyline. I, I think it needs a little bit of an editor, uh, an editorial past. There's a lot of text in here, I have to admit. Uh, some word usage was a little bit squirrely. Some things seemed to, to be a little bit in terms of typos, like you for your, things like that. But nothing that ruined the experience. I, I think it was well put together. Uh, I think it's not going to be for people that don't like a lot of reading, but I think that it is pretty interesting. I would like to see how the combat develops uh, later in the game, because it looks like you can collect different skills and such. Um, I personally think it's neat. Uh, if you want to check it out, I will leave a link to where you can take a look at it on uh, itch.io, I think that's where I've got it. Or no, I've got it on Game... game uh, I'll put the Game Jolt link uh, below, and I will try to put the Steam link, if I, if I can find one, uh, to, to keep an eye on it um, in the description below. Anyway, until next time, uh, if you like what you've seen, remember to leave a like, comment if you've got any feedback, and subscribe for more RPG content, both tabletop and computer. Until next time, take care and goodbye.